Thank you very much. Um, this is my affiliations, and I have uh, no conflicts of interest. Um, and my objectives, and I'll go through all these points individually, um, but in the main are to um, look at the research evidence around the role of physiotherapy, particularly for the, the management of persistent urinary incontinence. Um, and then because although there are some promising pieces of research, there, there's generally quite a lack of it. Um, I'll also talk um, about empirical evidence, um, some from my limited experience, um, but quite a lot that I've gathered from networking with other physiotherapists, either uh, working in their, their own country or visiting countries where they're, they're working with women who've experienced an obstetric fistula. Um, and this is where I've gained my experience. Um, a previous uh, UK physiotherapist, Leslie Cochran, helped them develop their uh, physiotherapy department from about 2003, and then asked me if I'd join her and take over her role when she wanted to retire. So I've been involved with the, the team at the uh, Hamlin Addis Ababa Fistula Hospital now since about 2008. Um, all or many of you may be aware that um, the Hamlins established the hospital there in 1974. Um, so I do appreciate it's a very established unit and the physiotherapy department is very established. So I'm always aware when I'm talking about um, what happens there that it's, it's probably very different from other people's experiences of uh, working in developing countries where there may be very little or uh, no physiotherapy provision. Um, but the team there, the top left photograph, um, the woman in the middle and the one at the far right are actually nurses who did a physiotherapy, Ethiopian nurses who did a physiotherapy diploma. So they actually have the dual skills of being uh, nurses with experience in that setting and then physiotherapist. And the other staff are their physio aides. And on the top right photograph, two of the nurse aides um, at Bahadar, one of their centers. And as you can see from the bottom two photographs, they actually have a reasonable physiotherapy department, um, which again is obviously quite unusual um, for people working with these women. And they moved into a new department, I think just in 2010, and it really is um, quite well resourced, even compared to some UK National Health Service departments I've visited. Um, so if we're thinking about uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy for the general uh, urogyne community, I think it's fair to say that we've really got some robust evidence about uh, the effectiveness of pelvic floor muscle training, particularly for stress urinary incontinence, but also as this um, recent uh, Cochrane review has said, um, possibly for all types of incontinence. So we have that evidence there. And more recently, and again, it's been um, discussed well within this meeting in previous years, we also now have some nice evidence supporting the role of pelvic floor physiotherapy for pelvic organ prolapse. But, and I'm sure uh, any of you who've been involved and the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, the women we see who've experienced uh, an obstetric fistula, especially the complex ones, are very different from um, your general urogyne uh, or urology community and um, almost inevitably they're going to have muscle and fascial damage. Um, interestingly, as Susie said earlier, I would have expected that um, a lot of them are going to have significantly altered pelvic floor muscle anatomy and function, um, but Peter Dietz visited the Addis Ababa Fistula Hospital and did this study with 95 women where he saw them either preoperatively or post-repair and undertook real-time ultrasound study. Um, and he actually found that out of his 95 women, there were only six who, given uh, advice on how to contract their pelvic floor muscles, couldn't do a contraction. And only two, if they coughed, who didn't get a reflex contraction. And this, um, as it states here, was his uh, conclusion. So that possibly wasn't what many of us would have expected him to find. And I think I tend to think that it's probably because when you look at some of the uh, diagrams that we've been shown already about the level of obstruction, 
possibly the head just never gets anywhere down as far as the pelvic floor. So if there's some um, secondary necrosis that affects it, it's going to affect the pelvic floor, but possibly not actually the, the obstructed labour itself. Um, and again, this has been well covered in the previous talks, looking at the risk factors for um, persistent urinary incontinence following successful repair. And um, I think it's fair to argue that all those things there may mean that um, although the pelvic floor muscles may be working, there are lots of aspects of the normal continence mechanism that aren't working. And that's probably why we have to question um, how effective pelvic floor muscle training is uh, going to be. Um, the first bit of research um, that I want to mention that has come out this year um, from Eve Castile and a uh, team visiting Benin. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail later on about that, but you can see from this they were, it was a continence, uh, sorry, a, uh, a fistula mission, um, and uh, 99 women who went had a repair of their fistula but without any physiotherapy and health education. But at the next mission, uh, 112 women who went for surgery um, were seen for education and physiotherapy pre-operatively and again post-operatively. And I'll go a little bit more later into the specifics of the intervention. Um, and they were looking at the outcome um, in relation to persistent urinary incontinence, but also actually in relation to um, success of the repair itself. And as you can see, um, they got some really nice results in relation to the probability of uh, post-operative stress urinary incontinence. Interestingly, and it might be something we want to discuss at some point, um, they also showed a trend th uh, that the women who'd had the pre-operative physiotherapy and advice were more likely to actually have a successful repair, which with my limited experience wasn't something I'd really thought uh, to look for. <coughs> Um, actually, before I go on to that, my apologies, I submitted my slides and there's been a more recent paper since um, by Kayser et al, 2014, and that was a pilot of um, physiotherapy intervention, primarily post-operatively, um, but where they could see women pre-operatively, where they saw over 100 women in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, and assessed their pelvic floor and saw them again afterwards. They assessed their um, subjective report of urinary incontinence post-operatively and then um, their subjective report at discharge and also checked their pelvic floor muscles again and found there was a trend to a, a modest, well, there was a modest improvement in pelvic floor muscle strength and function um, and that the women who were reporting some urinary incontinence post-operatively were more likely to report an improvement when they'd done, this was a very short-term follow-up, um, but some improvement. Um, there were women who got worse, but actually the six who said that they were worse were found to have a, a repair that had failed. So um, if I then take the little bit of evidence, but also my experience, not my experience, but the experience of the Ethiopian physiotherapy team um, who I visit, who've been doing the work there now for at least 11 years, then this is their approach based on um, what they found in their practice. And they aim to see everybody pre-repair, which actually works quite well in Addis Ababa. Um, and they will explain the pelvic floor they will teach pelvic floor contraction. Um, unless there's a failure for the women to consent, they'll observe and digitally examine. Um, and based on what they find in pelvic floor muscle function, they'll teach them uh, pelvic floor muscle exercises based on the, the length of hold and the number of repetitions they can do. They keep some basic documentation, and they're fortunate enough to have two nurse aides on the ward who will actually visit the women preoperatively and postoperatively and remind them to do their exercises three to five times a day. Looking back at the uh, Benin paper, um, they actually saw people at the camp they were in before they had repair for group education um, around uh, teaching uh, the pelvic floor muscle exercises. They assessed them individually, not digitally, but using, I think, manometric biofeedback uh, via a vaginal electrode. Um, they also had advice on a poster that they reinforced, and I'll show you the poster um, in a few minutes. 
and they taught a hyperpressive exercise. Um, now, hyperpressive exercise is something that um, isn't commonly done in the UK, um, but some of you may be more aware of it. And just uh, in case you're not, I just uh, had a quick look online at a reliable page about it. Um, I contacted the, the author about, for more specifics, but he said it was just a simple hyperpressive technique, so I have no idea details about what they taught. But this is what you get, and there's more information that you can gain about that. Um, not surprisingly, I could find no evidence about the effect of hyperpress hyperpressive exercise within the fistula population, but I did find um, a couple of papers um, at the bottom there which um, suggested in a general uh, population it didn't necessarily show any added value over just pelvic floor muscle exercises alone. Um, and this, uh, they kindly gave me permission to reproduce this. And this is the poster that they produced um, in Benin. And when I showed this to the uh, physio team in Addis Ababa, they, they felt that it was great, the idea of having a visual poster. Um, with my limited French, I can just about work out that it's talking about um, positions to adopt in sleeping, um, when they're lifting but to avoid heavy lifting and the uh, activities along the bottom are things to avoid completely. But we decided that was a really useful thing. So that's there and that reinforces the advice uh, that they give in the groups and it's also present on the wards so that the women have got something, it doesn't really matter about their level of literacy, they've got something that they can uh, look at and be reminded of the advice they're given. Um, Post-operative physiotherapy, I've, I've subsequently been writing a chapter on uh, the role of physiotherapy following uh, or in, involved with obstetric fistula and I did have a look and I could find uh, definitely no research evidence about um, when people should start doing pelvic floor muscle exercises, uh, whether they should wait till the catheter's out, whether they should wait till after that, there should be a delay. Um, the only thing I would say is if... Um, Peter Dietz and his study found that if women cough, their pelvic floor muscles contract whether they want them to or not. Um, I would argue um, that possibly it's okay to start doing gentle pelvic floor muscle contractions probably as soon as you like because your muscles are going to be contracting uh, whether you do it actively or not. Um, as far as what to do with pelvic floor muscle exercises, um, you're probably very aware attending this conference that if you look at the literature around pelvic floor muscle exercises, most researchers do something different from the next researcher. Um, so the top um, program is what Castile et al. suggested. Um, that may be based on their experience. Um, I think they're from Belgium. Um, but the system at the Addis Ababa Fistula Hospital and the Kaiser 2014 paper, which I don't have on my slides, was um, a model that's used quite often in the UK based on work by Joe Laycock, where um, you would digitally assess the pelvic floor, um, give it a, a ox modified Oxford grading, see how long they could hold it for and as many repetitions as they could, and you would base your regime of exercises on that. But again, um, I think that we could perhaps argue that it's uh, because there has been no um, optimal pelvic floor muscle training regime identified. Um, it's just important that you get them doing pelvic floor muscle exercises and perhaps we have to wait until we come up with a, a more definitive regime that is shown to be more successful than others in robust studies. Um, this is the same in any physiotherapy practice. You know, we don't just teach exercises. Um, I always smile about quality of fluid intake because my visits are all to Ethiopia where they appear to drink about a gallon of extremely strong coffee every day. Um, and certainly when we were talking about uh, maybe symptoms of overactive bladder, it's, uh, it may well be contributing a bit to that. Uh, but they're certainly encouraged to drink um, adequate quantities of water as well. Um, as Susie, I think, mentioned constipation. So um, there would be advice around that in relation to fluid intake and possibly even abdominal massage. The NAC, which I'm sure um, most or all of you are aware of, um, originally by Miller et al. in 1998 and uh, confirmed again in a later paper, is uh, teaching a woman to contract her pelvic floor muscles ahead of a rise of intra-abdominal pressure, in particular like a cough or a sneeze. But I think you could then use that for things like lifting, um, which have been shown in women with stress urinary incontinence to decrease the volume or, uh, of leakage if they can contract their muscles first. So 
it's common practice that physiotherapists teach that. Um, we would also, as the uh, Castile et al. did in Benin, want to give advice on uh, different activities of daily living, and particularly in relation to things like squatting and lifting, which may be so much part of their life when they go home, teaching them to co-contract the pelvic floor muscles at that time. Um, bladder training, um, if there is urinary frequency or other symptoms of overactive bladder, um, a bladder chart may uh, not be um, feasible. Um, and I'd written pieces of paper on here because that was all the information I had. But I've noticed that on Friday, um, there's a poster presentation number 705, I think, um, by a, a doctor who has visited Addis Ababa. And um, this is the basis of the information I was given when I was in Addis earlier this year, where they give women scraps of paper and an envelope and just say to them, each time you go to the toilet, put a piece of paper in the envelope and hand it in at the end of the day. So it gives you nothing like the, um, the specific information that you get from a bladder chart, but actually it's a pretty good way to, to monitor whether people do have urinary frequency and perhaps to measure the outcome of your intervention. So Friday late morning, poster 705. And I think the one after that's another one related to work in Addis Ababa. So worth seeing, both being presented. Um, follow up, um, Castile et al followed up at three, six and 12 months and they followed up everybody in their local community. And some people had come in from outside Benin, um, but it was trained health workers in that locality and they've yet to publish those results, but they have been submitted for publication. Um, it's a challenge, and certainly in Addis Ababa, they do like people to return, and particularly people who are discharged symptomatic. Um, I'm sure it's the same in other countries, but it's a big challenge in, in Addis Ababa for people to be able to travel. Uh, they're fortunate enough to have their outreach center, so sometimes people will visit there. But they do ask people to come back at six months, um, but it's uh, really up to the woman whether she, she does come back or not. And currently, unless they've developed things in the last year or so, they haven't got a very, um, they haven't found a way yet to be able to go out and visit people consistently. Um, and I think we know from some of the work, Emma Mura was a review of the conservative management of stress urinary incontinence in a general population that uh, indicated that the evidence is if people can see, be seen more often than just given advice once, then the outcomes of the pelvic floor muscle training are probably going to be more effective. So another reason it would be nice to follow up people when and where you can. Um, thinking about adjunct treatments, um, again, Imamura et al. identified in the general population that if you add biofeedback, um, it may make uh, pelvic floor muscle training um, more effective. And that might be a surface EMG or manometric and generally with an intravaginal probe. Um, I think from the point of view of this population, and again, there's been a lot of talk about what the vagina's like, a lot of these women who've had a, a complex fistula and their repair. So you have things like the, the cost and the availability and the servicing of machines and um, disposables like the electrodes. But I think also you have this question about how many women it would be suitable just because you probably wouldn't be able to use a um, vaginal device. And likewise, the same with stimulation, our guidance uh, with our general uh, population or women with urinary incontinence in the UK is that we don't routine, routinely use uh, electrical stimulation, but there may be a role for it or for biofeedback, particularly if women can't contract their pelvic floor muscles um, voluntarily. So again, then there may possibly be a role if machinery is available, you identify the right women and um, you can actually use an intra-vaginal uh, device. Um, Lots of challenges, and I think it was Chris who mentioned language, and certainly my work in Addis Ababa, the um, Amharic-speaking physiotherapist has to use an interpreter several times a day because there's three principal languages in the country and I think 82 dialects. And as Chris said, you can sometimes have three people sitting in the room, and if you're the one who has to hear in English, it just adds another step. So, um, it's, And that sometimes involves using another patient who speaks the same dialect, who's come for treatment to, to do it. Uh, so it's, it's, it is challenging. Um, we say, I've, as I say, writing a book chapter, we've we stressed for visiting physiotherapists that wherever you go, and I'm sure it goes without saying, you've just got to be sensitive to your uh, local community and get some understanding of it. Um, 
literacy may be an issue. Um, I thought possibly rather arrogantly that women might have difficulty understanding the concept of the pelvic floor and pelvic floor exercises, and my findings are that they don't. As long as you explain things to them well, uh, they act the same as the women I meet in the north of England. So I think that was just my ignorance, really. Um, resources are obviously a problem financially, less so in Addis Ababa, but um, you know, if you want a model of a pelvis or something or equipment you're going to use, um, that's obviously a challenge. And as I mentioned earlier, um, follow-up's an issue. And uh, amongst the physiotherapy committee here at ICS, there's a discussion about compliance with pelvic floor muscle training amongst everybody we see. Um, so I think we can have that issue just as much, if not more so, especially if people aren't seeing quick results um, with their pelvic floor muscle training. Um, there will be people, and uh, Chris will talk more about this with persistent bladder dysfunction. Um, in Addis Ababa, because the physiotherapist who was there was a nurse physiotherapist, she was the one who was responsible for the people who had uh, incomplete emptying, either uh, with incontinence or without, and was responsible for teaching them double or triple voiding to empty as well as possible and to teach them intermittent self-catheterization. And there they would give them a rigid catheter, I think, to take away and supply enough for about six months. So I think they used one a fortnight or one a week, but I could be wrong about that. But they certainly just took some away, washed them. It may have been even fewer than that they gave them. Um, what they did in Addis, and I think they'd done it some of the, maybe at Bahadar and the other outreach centres um, introduced, I think, by Andrew Browning in the early 2000s was the use of urethral plugs. Um, actually, Chris, this is a good time to pass it around. Yeah, some of you may be aware, or all of you may well be aware of the, the FEMSOF urethral insert. Um, but these were used to actually put into the urethra and uh, where women were not succeeding with pelvic floor muscle training or anything else and removed for voiding. Um, and they were being used uh, regularly when I went to Addis Ababa. So what we did a couple of years ago now was just looked at some retrospective physiotherapy data of 180 women that um, just on self-reported uh, incontinence found that, um, you know, more than three quarters said they were dry using a plug. Some used it just daytime, some used it day and night. Um, and if you add the ones who said they were better, but not completely dry, but vaguely satisfied with it, it was more than 85% of them found them successful. Um, and the 26 who were wet um, were the ones who perhaps had the risk factors and had had more complex fistulae in the first place. Um, we weren't using it, as the manufacturers suggest. They're single use. They should be put in, taken out, probably not used for more than a few hours. And these women were getting a supply for six months that meant if they were using it day and night, they were given enough for one a day. No, sorry, one a week. And if they were just using them during the day, they were given enough for one a fortnight. So they were going home, washing them as they could, and reinserting them. But we did find in the study there were, there were issues about urine. Uh, we didn't have any consistent data about um, urine infections when they came back, but anecdotally, most of them did have a, a urine infection most of the time. And there had been um, a couple of incidents of them migrating into the bladder or rupturing, um, and they were removed with cystoscopy, but there were no long-term problems afterwards. Um, but obviously that's not the normal use of the, the plugs. The manufacturers knew we were publishing the paper and uh, that's not how it's, they should be used. Um, and there's also an issue of cost um, and availability and there's been a bit of a supply issue recently um, in Addis Ababa, which means that you've got these women coming back from outreach, outreaches saying they want more and they haven't had any to give them for a while, just a hiatus, but, but there are obviously issues like that as well. Um, so I'd like to think that um, there's a role for physiotherapy. Um, and uh, I th obviously not everybody can supply the same service, but, but what I feel from the information I've gathered and the research out there is that it would be nice if preoperative pelvic floor muscle assessment and advice could be given to all women um, or immediately postoperatively. Um, and early assessment and exercises. In Addis, actually, the women who have their catheter out and they're dry and they're voiding well go home and they don't see the physiotherapist again. So actually, they only see the ones who've got ongoing problems. Um, it would be nice to think there could be long-term follow-up and, and more physiotherapy for the women with persistent urinary incontinence, along with 
urodynamic investigations and anticholinergics if that's available and just slightly off what I meant to be talking about I think if you're going to get physiotherapists there are definitely other roles for them to make it worthwhile having them um, and we were discussing actually off camera um, what the rate of, of women with uh, rehab needs is and it's quite high in Addis Ababa but speaking to some other physiotherapists it's perhaps not always the, the same proportion in other countries um, but certainly anecdotally they report that 15 to 20 percent of the women they see have some form of rehab and if it's severe especially lower limb contractures they need quite a lot of treatment before they can even have their surgery undertaken um, there's a role for post-op rehab for those who need even further rehab we haven't touched on um, anorectal dysfunction um, uh, or uh, rectovaginal fistula where there's obviously a role as well um, and I would also probably add here that um, if anybody have any, if they have any diversion surgery is not my forte, but the ones who have a mains pouch, my understanding is that they then need to have a strong puborectalis and anal sphincter because they're going to be holding urine uh, in the rectum hopefully uh, until they can uh, pass it in an appropriate place. I think there's definitely a role for staff education, and that certainly happens at Addis, and particularly involved with the uh, Hamlin College for Midwives, so that the message can be going out into the community for prevention and certainly for management in future pregnancies. And also because the women are coming back to the centres to have their caesarean section if they get pregnant again, then the physios are involved there as well. And uh, obrigado. Thank you very much. Any questions for Jill, please? So one of the things you were talking about, uh, Jill, was um, two things, actually. The role of, man um, and I'm always interested in managing constipation with uh, physio mm. techniques. Um, did you find that was helpful in that setting as well, as equally as helpful? I don't think... I don't think it's being done much in Addis um, mm. at all. I know that there was someone else who visited who was talking about it, and it was a great idea. So she did teach the, the physio some techniques um, around abdominal massage. Um, but obviously there's the, the, the idea of them mobilizing early, which most of them do, and adequate fluid intake and managing it in different ways. But um, I think there's quite a lot, again, not with this population, but there's... there's uh, there's quite a big study being un undertaken in the UK now looking at the effects of um, abdominal massage for constipation in a general population. So I think it's a, a fair thing to suggest if it seems appropriate. I think just sometimes dietary changes for them um, and uh, as you were saying, along with medication like codeine mm. um, may be an issue. So I think there probably is a role for it um, for those women who are particularly troubled by it. Okay. Yes, please, Chris. Um, we do, yeah. So, I mean, I think um, obviously, although the the evidence in a general population is more out there for stress, urinary incontinence. Um, Aspects like bladder training may well fall under the remit of a physiotherapist if, if there is a physiotherapist at a fistula centre. And I think even if there may not be any evidence or as much evidence for pelvic floor muscle training for um, overactive bladder or urgency urinary incontinence, physiotherapists teach it anyway. Partly, A, so you might get to the toilet before you leak, and B, in the hope that you trigger some inhibitory reflex and actually your detrusor relaxes. So physiotherapists always include that in their sort of holistic approach. Do you think there's a, a role for physiotherapy um, immediately after VVF surgery? Um, do you mean uh, as in sort of on the ward? And I think um, I've mentioned it when I've been mm. writing about mm. it, that there could be a role, certainly if you're seeing people um, pre-operatively because of rehab needs and talking about dealing with contractures, then there's a role or an educational role. The nursing staff are brilliant, but an educational role in positioning and early mobilization. You may, but I think we've said already that on the whole, they're quite a young, otherwise healthy population, but you would certainly look for any respiratory complications post-operatively. But as Chris said, they're generally up on day one anyway. Mm. Um, and as I say, there's, I think there's this debate about when you start pelvic floor exercises, and that might be the same if you're talking about a general gynae community and, and do it, but uh, the physio aides on the wards do just encourage them with anything that the physiotherapist has told them. So actually the setup in Addis is very good because they've got somebody constantly nagging them about it. Yeah. 
more questions for Jill. Well, thank you very much, Jill. That's thank okay. you for that. Thank you.